carry and express the message of God's love to every single human being in words and deeds. Dear friends, I come with words of encouragement to you here in Sweden so that you don't miss the opportunity resulting from the profound changes affecting your society today, your congregations, your parishes, and the church as a whole. I would urge you to see these changes as a new opportunity, to ask anew what it is to be the church here and today. Secularization, a much more diverse society with many different cultures, its multi-religious composition, declining membership, all these changes shouldn't be obstacles for a renewed and sustained reflection and a discernment about this church's call into God's mission, but an opportunity to define how the church claims its citizenship anew. But let me shift gears now and move away from my extensive explanation about the good reasons to be in the public space and look now into the contributions that a church brings into that space. As I do so, I will connect to the thoughts I offered at the beginning of my presentation, referring to Martin Luther's theological insight that God's favor can't be achieved or bought, but is just a free gift out of God's love. I mentioned that this theological insight had already been there for quite some time, but as a somehow dormant treasure. Indeed, I believe that the church draws from these very treasures, dormant or at the surface, when it engages in the public space. The distinctiveness, and please note the word I'm using here, it is distinctiveness and not superiority. The distinctiveness of what the church can offer in the public space is rooted in the fact that their voice and witness is based on faith. It is a faith-based perspective, a faith-based contribution, a thought and a witness based on faith in the triune God. No church should shy away from that identity, but should instead offer it with joy and humility for the shared public space where indeed other voices with different insights and perspectives will also be heard. It requires a, an effort, therefore, so that these insights rooted in faith and brought into words through theological reflection are communicated in an adequate way. Because these remain as two distinct categories, the preaching on Sunday morning and the participation in the public discourse. In my own observation, this faith-based perspective is very much sought, especially today as communities, nations, and even the entire human family deal with current trends, challenges, and even major threats. This is somehow an acknowledgement that the current challenges, climate change and financial crisis, just to name two, do require an interdisciplinary approach in order to be addressed adequately. The financial crisis, for instance, has for quite some time now become an expression of a disturbance that goes far beyond the technicalities of borrowing and lending. It is an expression of the limits of an ideology and its underlying value system. It is an expression of a deeply disturbing approach to relationships with the neighbor and with the entire creation. It is an expression of an understanding of freedom that doesn't seem to know about accountability anymore. I will come back to this aspect later in my presentation. However, I want to stay focused on the global issues that I mentioned earlier financial crisis and ecological crisis. I am insisting all the time that they are two sides of the same coin, as they are an expression of the same fundamental problem. 
the human family intends to live on resources that do not exist, financially and ecologically. The current lifestyles, at least of an important, important section of societies in this world, are largely beyond dimension. They are unsustainable. Current attempts to address these global issues and to avert their huge risk, particularly for the most vulnerable populations in the world, have been rather disappointing. It is becoming evident today that national interests prevail and that the fate of the global human, human family altogether sometimes even becomes hostage to particular election campaigns in certain sovereign states. The shared interests of the global human family become subject to the national interests of some few countries. For me, the most pressing challenge of the current times seems to be the absence of both a mindset and of structures for a global citizenship and the requisite instrument to address global issues in their global dimensions today. The Lutheran World Federation is such an attempt to assume the citizenship of churches around the world in its global dimension. It is now 65 years ago since different Lutheran churches in the year 1947 came together and decided to exert their global responsibility and founded for this purpose the LWF, Lutheran World Federation. It was actually here in Sweden, in the city of Lund, where all this happened. Church of Sweden has been and continues to this day to be a vital actor in the LWF's processes and its journey towards global citizenship. At that time, in 1947, the major call to these churches came from the plight of millions of refugees and displaced persons in Europe, a challenge that could not be addressed at a national level anymore, but required a different, a global approach. Churches gathered in the LWF to give their citizenship an adequate structure in order to respond to the dramatic situation of refugees. But there was more that motivated them to do so. Lutheran churches at that time felt compelled to become part of the immense task of reconciliation between people, between nations, and even between churches which were all together experiencing fragmentation, deep suspicion, and even hostility as a consequence of the devastating conflict of the Second World War. In no way do I find as either obsolete or outdated this architecture that our forefathers and foremothers designed in order to express the responsible citizenship of churches at a global level. On the contrary, the ability of churches to connect globally is required with the same urgency because our current times are actually so paradox. There has never been in history such a wealth of resources and means to communicate with people, communities, nations, and churches across the globe. Yet, the availability of these means of communication doesn't seem to have improved communication. Actually, this availability of means of communication sometimes even seems to have triggered helplessness in communication, if not fragmentation. Whether one looks at societies, nations, cultures, religions, or churches, there seems to be an overall mood of withdrawal into safe comfort zones reflecting a refusal to deal with the complexity of alternative identities and the challenging reality of overwhelming diversity, or even worse, wanting to ban or to eradicate, sometimes even violently, what is different. 
I believe that the citizenship of churches in this world calls today for resistance against this mod mood and to develop counter-cyclical attitudes to this tendency of withdrawal and fragmentation both locally and globally. The faith-based nature of churches calls them today into the public space as bridge builders and as strong advocates for peace with justice. Let me come now to the final part of my presentation and still refer to the two global challenges that I mentioned earlier. The financial crisis and the ecological crisis as two sides of the same coin. How do churches come in here? Isn't the discussion too specific and too complex? Aren't even members of parliament in European countries often helpless as they have to deal sometimes overnight with highly complicated matters regarding the financial crisis? And they are already acknowledging that they increasingly feel dependent on experts and lobbies in order to exert at all their duties. I believe, as I said before, that what is required today is an interdisciplinary discussion. And I believe that churches and religions all together should be part of that discussion, bringing their own distinctive voice into the conversation, yet at the same time being ready to take in what other disciplines know and have developed. I will give you one example, a painful one, but that illustrates quite drastically what I want to say. I mentioned above that one of the vocations of the LWF is the work with refugees in this world. Today, the LWF supports 1.2 million refugees around the world. We do this for the sake of the refugees and on behalf of the 143 member churches in the LWF, your church included.